Welcome to the Talent Development Hot Seat, a show where I interview business executives, talent development professionals, and thought leaders to find out what has been successful and challenging in the world of talent development. My objective is to share ideas, valuable lessons, tools, advice, and trends. My hope is that all of this will ultimately help you, the listener, expand your knowledge, grow your career, and accelerate your success as a talent development professional. Welcome back to another episode of the Talent Development Hot Seat. I am your host, Andy Storch, and I am grateful that you are joining me today for an interview with Laura Daniels. And Laura is an innovative and results-oriented head of learning and employee experience with over a decade leading high-performing teams to transform individuals, teams, cultures, and organizations. Currently, Laura manages a diverse team of learning and development consultants at Kaiser Permanente and is leading KP's shift from hundreds of programs to an enterprise-wide integrated learning and development framework to enhance uh, the employee experience for 250,000 employees and leaders uh, around the area. Laura has built numerous programs and won many awards during her time at Kaiser as well as Pacific Gas and Electric where she was before. Laura is a world traveler, a fitness and adventure enthusiast, a philanthropist, and an education addict who has an MBA from the University of Houston and is working on a PhD in psychology from Pepperdine. Laura, welcome to the Talent Development Hot Seat. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm absolutely honored to be here this morning. Happy yeah, good, Friday. Good, happy Friday. Good to have you on. I filled in some gaps there. I, don't, I hope you don't mind. I called you an education addict because I saw you have <laughs> like multiple really degrees, just, still studying, which I love. It's great. You know, lifelong learner and just happy to do what I love. Okay, so speaking of doing what you love, um, there are a lot of things we want to get into related to talent development, but one of the things that struck out for me uh, is that you have this uh, love of adventure and you've been to over 40 countries. Now, what, what's driving that and what's been your, your favorite trip? Oh, favorite trip. Well, thanks. Yeah, you know, I think it, I was kind of born. I uh, was actually born in Lake Tahoe. So I think in, to the you know, parent, two parents who were huge outdoor enthusiasts, enthusiasts and skiers. So I think I was born with adventure in my blood, I'd say. Um, so that probably led me to want to explore more mountains and valleys and streams all over the world. But it's, um, you know, once you, once you start traveling, I think it's, it's really hard to stop. Just I love agree. learning about other cultures. I agree. I feel the same way. I've, uh, like I said to you earlier, I've been to over 30 countries. I love traveling. I love experiencing different cultures. Um, okay, so what's your favorite country to visit or what's been your favorite trip so far? Oh, favorite country. It's hard. I'm going to parallel between probably Bhutan and then Patagonia down in uh, Chile Ooh, or Argentina. Nice. Two places I haven't been. I've always wanted to go to Patagonia. Um, that's amazing. Uh, I will go with uh, Japan, especially Tokyo. I love and uh, Portugal a few years ago, I spent some time in Lisbon and just loved it so much. Great place to visit. Um, very different places, but both have wonderful, nice people, great food, and uh, and the coast as well. So can't go Amazing. wrong. Amazing. I can't wait to get I've never been to Portugal. I can't wait to get out there. Oh, so good. All right. Let's get into uh, your background and especially your areas of expertise. Um, we were talking, you talked about having a passion around consumerization of HR and emergence of employee experience, as well as leading change in large complex systems. And you are definitely in a large complex system now <laughs> with uh, over 250,000 employees at Kaiser, I'm sure across many different locations and different types of systems that have probably been acquired over the years. Tell me a little bit more about your role and what you're doing at Kaiser. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always laugh when this comes up because, you know, I think the role that I was hired for is nowhere near the job I do on a daily basis. Uh, but I've never wanted to stick right in, stick right in my, my seat, if you will. Um, so Kaiser's hyper complex. To your point, it operates across eight different regions across the country from Hawaii to D.C. and, and Georgia. So really different cultures. And a lot of people don't know this, but behind the scenes, Kaiser Permanente is actually three separate business entities. So there's our consumers see Kaiser Permanente, but it's actually comprised of a nonprofit hospital and health plan, and then for-profit medical groups or partnerships. And so the complexity of this environment, as you can imagine, is really intense. And my work at Kaiser right now is really leading a grassroots effort 
to go from hundreds and hundreds of leadership programs across you know, hundreds of hospitals and medical office buildings, really to have one consistent shared leader experience across the enterprise. And so it's uh, definitely been a grassroots effort of trying to influence and get people to buy into this kind of bigger vision of what's possible when we come together. That's awesome. And such a, a huge task in front of you and will create some great experience for you. Um, okay. So speaking of this idea of shared leader experience um, and this emergence of the employee experience, I want to talk about this because I think this is something that's becoming more common. It's trending. Um, a few months ago, I released my top five trends in talent development uh, based on doing over 70 interviews with talent leaders like you to that point. And one of those top trends was uh, treating employees like customers or like consumers, basically saying that, you know, hey, our employees have a choice. They can go work anywhere they want. In this modern economy, it's easy to move around. We have to give them a great experience or they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. So tell me your perspective on that and, and why this consumerization of HR is, is important for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm so excited about this, Andy, because you know, for so many years, we've really taken a viewpoint from organizations. We've been talking about employee engagement and how do we get for folks more engaged. And if you look into kind of the consumer side of things, they figured out a long time ago, you really have to put yourself in the shoes of the consumers and think about it from their viewpoint. What are the moments that really matter to them as they're going through that experience and consumer journey? And so I think now that organizations are really feeling this pressure in the war for talent, and you're right, employees won't stay unless they feel like an organization's really taking care of them. It's no longer just about what's the organization getting in terms of engagement, but it's really forcing organizations to look at it from the employee side to understand what is the holistic experience that employees need to really be fulfilled in their jobs, whether that's aligned to the purpose and the mission, how are we taking care of them, mind, body, spirit, wellness, um, these things are going to be kind of status quo, I think, in the future. So I'm really excited to see kind of this combination of the consumer and employee experience coming together, that it's really one thing. Um, I, I joke a lot that, you know, Organizations talk so much about the consumer experience or in healthcare, we talk about the care or patient or member experience. But I always think of employee experience as basically a magnifying glass. And you can invest tenfold into an employee, it'll have 10x the results on your patient and care experience. And so I think this is something that's gonna benefit both the business and humanity across the board. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, that is great. I like that uh, employee experience as a magnifying glass of a 10x results on patients and customers. And this goes back to something that I've said a few times on this podcast that I learned from someone else, uh, which is that your customer's experience will never exceed that of your employee's experience. And so many companies are not paying attention to that. But if you treat your employees well, they're more likely to treat your customers or your patients well. And if your employees show up at work and they hate their job because they're not being treated very well, they're probably not going to treat the patients or the customers very well either, right? Are you, are you seeing that? Exactly. It, it's, you know, I think it's common sense. We knew this for so long, but now seeing thought leaders like you know, Jacob Morgan, who wrote the Employee Experience Advantage, come out and really putting some kind of data and figures behind, wow, this has a big impact on company crop profitability, on the consumer retention. Um, I think organizations are really starting to pay attention to this. So it's exciting that HR is going to be able to play, you know, so for so long we've played this role of, you know, kind of an, an affordability driver of how do we get more cost savings with our talent or get them more engaged. And, you know, I think that our professionals in our industry are starting to see we not only can enable the business, we can drive true value by enhancing the experience of our employees. So it's an exciting time. Okay, tell me more about this because I'm one of my missions with this podcast, I've decided, is to help talent development professionals become more of a strategic partner in the business and stop being just a cost center to look at the business priorities, business strategies, connect learning to that, and find a way to advance that strategy so they become more of a partner and not just a cost center. And yeah. so what you're saying is if you're able to improve, increase this employee experience, that it's going to have direct financial results to improve operations, improve the, the strategy execution. Uh, so tell me more about that because that 
you know, it seems like, oh, I've got to invest all of this in, in, in making people happier at work, but what am I going to get from that? Exactly. Well, you know, this, I share your passion, Andy. Um, I'm in, being an MBA by background. I think, you know, I, I always tend to, to look at things from a business perspective, but, you know, wanting to keep the heart of our people there. Um, I think the biggest thing is we have to be able to show value and show results. And so if we can't in HR tell a compelling story about how increasing our employee experience actually impacts the bottom line, we can't really create a business case. And HR for so long, in my opinion, they've really been behind the business. We've been these order takers of, you know, if you think in healthcare, I think about a physician or a surgeon um, or a cardiologist. We rely on these experts and these specialists and we go to them and you don't see, you know, we don't push back on the doctor and say, you know, that's real nice cardiologist, but, you know, we really think from an affordability perspective, you should do this other surgery. We know they're the experts. And so I think it's really on us as talent development professionals to truly be the experts and be able to share the evidence behind these re this research, why and how this um, these investments are actually going to add strategic business value. So at Kaiser, you know, we've got some gr great data analytics. So we've been able to really tie and look at, okay, those that have employee engagement scores that are in the top 8% of the company, they have significantly higher um, patient and member satisfaction scores. They have lower incidence of patient and employee um, workplace safety issues. So really tying it to the hard data to say, if we can get this up 5 to 10%, what is the true impact on our business? But that under, that starts with really understanding the business at its core. Okay, how do you measure that? How do you know that the employee experience is getting better and therefore the patient experience is getting better? Yeah, so um, I think this is really in the beginning stages. And so when you look at kind of how the Silicon Valley has defined kind of employee experience, they're bucketing it into kind of three areas um, around culture, kind of physical workplace and technological workplace. Um, there's some other kind of employee EX models out there. Um, I think that I like a little bit better that are a little bit more holistic. Um, so I don't think there's a model that I necessarily prescribe to. Right now what I'd say is it really comes down to mapping that journey for your key employee groups in your organization. And so to give you an example, the employee, the experience of an employee who has been in an organization like Kaiser Permanente for 40 years um, is the moments that matter for them as a, an employee are really different than perhaps the moments that matter for a young, diverse millennial leader. Those moments of impact of them are really different. So if you talk to people on the consumer or marketing side, they wouldn't tell you we have a, you know, the same approach for everyone like vanilla. They would say, look, we've got market segment, different market segments, and these are our strategies to really engage these consumers. And I think that we in the talent development space need to do the same thing as we look at employee experience because it's really a different and personal thing. You know, what matters to you is different than what matters to me. You know, I care a lot about vacation time for these travels where somebody else might care a whole lot about their benefits or about maternity leave and things like this. So it's really a very personal experience. Yeah, I agree. And I see and hear companies talking more about personalizing the career development experience. Um, but how do you do that when you, especially when you have 250,000 employees spread across a lot of different locations on different systems and all these things, how do you make their experience feel personal? Yeah. So I think first it starts with identifying what are the big major groups. We can't tackle you know, everything at once. So our par probably our biggest group of managers, when I think about leaders, is our nurse managers. And this is one of the toughest jobs in healthcare. When you look at the, the nurse manager experience, they may have you know, 30 to 100 direct reports of nurses reporting into them, really stressful positions in ERs or the NICU. And so um, really understanding their experience, starting with really using things like human-centered design, getting them in a room and understanding what are the experiences that matter? Having them tell you. I think it you know, all really starts with empathy, empathy. And so we've started a huge series of kind of focus groups with these big kind of large groups of managers to really understand for them what are those moments that really matter. And then aligning that with our engagement surveys. So we've got engagement surveys, but there's other things, other kinds of ways that we're serving the organization. Um, we've got a huge focus right now Kaiser Permanente is really known for our work. Um, we're one of the, we've consistently been one of the top kind of organizations to work for, for diverse, um, 
diverse leaders and diverse employees of, of all types. And so um, we do a lot of work in serving levels of belonging um, and really understanding what do we need to really create kind of an inclusive environment that um, creates an environment where employees feel heard, listened to, they belong, and where they can share their ideas to help us be innovative. Um, and so through a lot of these different surveys and instruments, getting this information, really coming back, creating these journey maps by these core kind of segment groups. So to give you an example, we've got um, something within Kaiser called the Hatch Group, which is basically like a little incubator that focuses specifically on just millennial strategy for both our consumers and for our employees. And so Kaiser's really kind of pushing the needle in terms of large organizations and trying to better understand what are those preferences and how are they changing. Um, yeah. Very cool. Uh, you mentioned uh, moments that matter a few times uh, in this interview already. And I'm familiar with this terminology, especially from working at BTS. And I know you've done some work with them as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about what that means and what type of work you're doing there to really define and improve those moments that matter? Yeah, absolutely, Indian. Thanks. Um, I was so excited when we connected to learn about your history with BTS. Um, yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with BTS both in my past life at Pacific Gas and Electric and now bringing them into Kaiser Permanente, and I'm a huge fan. Um, you know, we spend so many time, so much time, especially in large, kind of more bureaucratic organizations, looking for, you know, efficiencies around virtual learning and kind of large-scale programs. And you know, as much as the talent development world talks about the need for experiential learning, um, we don't do a good enough job at it. We still don't. We're still sticking people in classrooms with models or putting them in virtual learnings and calling it experiential when it's really not. Um, so the way we've brought in BTS, our frontline managers, so those could be managers sitting in any geographic location, any function could be a nurse manager, could be somebody in you know an amb ambulatory setting that's managing, you know, um, a, a different department. Could be a finance or IT manager. We're really trying to build this kind of shared common language around leadership as our entire business really transforms, and we want to kind of unite towards our our shared agenda of changing health in America and eventually in the world. We need to have the same language, and so for so many years. Our physician said, no, you know, leadership development is different for physicians. It's different for finance. It's different for nurses. Um, and so, we're, you know, when we really get into the meat of, well, is it really different? Or is it really about understanding our business? How do we work together? Um, and so we brought in BTS um, really to complement as part of a, an initial program of, of what we're calling KP Leadership University, which is really the holistic kind of learning journey for new leaders from emerging leaders up through that executive level and our frontline manager program is called activate and we were talking a lot about concepts um, like creating that experience for employees leading change creating an environment for innovation um, how do they think from kind of an enterprise systems perspective um, and really kind of the, these key capabilities we needed to drive and so after a series of facilitated discussions we wanted to really put them in that seat of, okay, now what does this really look like in your medical center? What I love about BTS is that they will come in and understand your business better than a lot of your executives. And so for a company like Kaiser, who you know doesn't bring in a lot of outsiders typically, we want to do a lot of things ourselves. Um, I knew that we had to bring in a vendor that would be able to speak to our comp complexity and our model better than a lot of the leaders that are even in the organization. And so when they came in, we really wanted to look at, okay, now what are the critical moments in a day as a nursing manager in a hospital? And guess what? You know, they're not just thinking about giving feedback to their team. They're thinking about, you know, an emergency that's coming in the ER and how to 20 patients at the same time. And at the same time, there's, you know, some sort of patient risk or a workplace injury of a nurse trying to lift somebody up. There may be a Health Connect outage, and you think of all the HIPAA uh, regulations. How do you make sure if there's a Health Connect outage, all the equipment's working in a hospital? How do you make sure the systems and the documentation's getting done properly? And so, what's great about these, I say moments that matter, it's really a, a BTS term. These simulations, they choose what are those critical moments that managers face where they have to apply those skills they're learning about leadership. 
So when you look at, you know, leading change, um, and they have to think about how do I really lead change across a hospital where people have been here for, you know, 10 to 20, 30 years, where people are very comfortable. How do you really lead a change while you're constantly being disrupted by true fire drills and emergencies that are life-threatening, whether that's for your employees or whether that's for um, your patients. And so the these moments that matter really gave us the ability and, and it, it looks and feels like the environment of the hospital. Yeah. And I think, you know, our managers were just blown away because um, they said, you know, we've been to hundreds of leadership programs. This actually feels like my real life work day. Um, so we're so excited and that um, BTS started in Southern California in our Southern California regions. And right now they're starting to work with our other regions across the country. So uh, we're so excited about that work, Andy. Uh, that's really cool to hear. And uh, I gained so much great experience working at BTS and realizing that, uh, you know, the perspective that when you think about leadership and what creates good leadership, especially in those areas like you talked about, it often comes down to what are those critical moments? What are those moments and how do I take them from normal to being multiplying moments or moments where we can really uh, help other people around us? And why I think about the job of a nurse, there must be a lot of critical moments yeah. throughout the day where... Uh, you've really got to be operating at your best and we can define and see, okay, what do the best nurses, the best managers, the best leaders do in those moments and how do we help other people uh, experience that? And of course, I'm glad that you talked about experiential learning, which is something that I'm really big on, um, having worked at BTS for seven years and, and still uh, run a lot of experiential learning programs. I think people learn best through experience. And the other thing is I hear a lot of times uh, people I interview on here say, well, we, you know, we we like to customize things. So we'll, we'll take those in house because only we know our business. And, uh, my reaction is usually, no, actually sometimes I get, you know, what you said, which is, I, you know, we can get to know your business even better than you do. So if anybody's listening to that, thank you for selling BTS like you did. <laughs> really nice. Um, but anybody listening to that thinking, man, I'd really like to bring that into my organization. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, BTS is still my largest partner and I work with them on a lot of stuff and it sounds like they're doing a lot of great work with you, uh, Laura there at, uh, at KP. I wanted to shift a little bit and ask you about uh, leading change in a large complex system uh, because you do have so such a huge system. It is so complex, so bureaucratic, different from many other industries. Um, we talked about some of the experiences and defining those moments. Are there any other really important aspects to make sure you get down when you're leading a major change in a complex system like what you're in now? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Great question. It's you know definitely been the most challenging experience of, of my career, um, especially, you know, you look at a company like KP and huge culture of autonomy, and this is not a hierarchical organization where people say, you know, everyone will do X. That's just not how it works in this organization. And so uh, I think when, you know, some of the greatest things I've learned about leading change in these systems is you've got to use a carrot approach, you can't use a stick approach. And so many times people create these hyper complex change strategies and communications plans. And what they're missing is people want to feel included. They want to be engaged in the design. And so it's not about HR or a business leader going and creating some masterful plan. It's actually much less important. What's the most important is really building that shared vision and engaging those stakeholders, making them feel heard and represented in what you're doing so that when you're telling that story to these different groups, whether it's to physicians or to executive, you know, executives in the administrative suites or whether it's to you, you know, your frontline nursing managers or those interested in, in learning, how do you tell that story and really relate to people? At the end of the day, we're human and, and people don't always have a great kind of association with change, but if you can really understand and kind of keep the pulse on what is really important to these different stakeholder groups, then I think you're really able to build influence. And so, you know, so many times I see people in large organizations that go out and, you know, this is a directive from these leaders and this is what we're doing to support the business. And I always laugh to myself, you know, that's, that's, the least effective way you might get compliance at the best. Um, you've got to influence and really get to people's hearts. And that starts with understanding 
you know, what's important to them? How do you, you know, really shift this work to make sure that you're accomplishing your objectives with the voice um, of everyone that's included? Because that's the way you really kind of get that engagement. When we started this work, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really on the table. We just started kind of grassroots talking to other folks saying, you know, we're leading this big transformation in Southern California across, you know, 13 huge medical centers and trying to, you know, reduce duplication and, you know, why are we just doing this here? You know, why don't we all come together? What if we all came together with all of our resources? We could do something so much greater and bigger. And what could we do if we, you know, freed up more capacity and capability um, because we weren't repeating the same work, you know, 15 times over. And in an organization where you've got, you know, hundreds of HR folks, really thousands of HR folks, it's really easy to have duplication to say, you know, needs my client group in IT or, you know, the membership are really different. Um, but as part of it, we're human beings and leading people come down to relating to people and understanding them. Uh, so it's, been, it's been a great challenge. I would say, you know, opportunity abound. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And you talked about so many important things there, um, like empathy and compassion and making people feel like they've been heard, um, having them involved, um, engaging stakeholders and making them feel heard and represented. And the other thing I would add to that, that I think you're, you're kind of alluding to is if you've got a big change, determine who are those really influential people in the organization and get them on board uh, so that they are helping you along the way. And it's not just you telling everybody what to do and give them a chance to really experience what's going on, get them aligned um, and connect with them emotionally. That's such a critical, I run a, a program called Influence Inside that was created by a woman named uh, Kelly Dujois, really great uh, one day experience all about influence. And one of the key components of that is connecting to people emotionally as well as using data and other things uh, to influence, but connecting emotionally is such a, a big uh, impact of that uh, or part of that. Um, I want to shift again here and ask you a few quicker questions. Uh, the first of which, Laura, is uh, what's been your greatest accomplishment or your proudest moment in talent development so far? Yeah, you know, I'm really proud, Andy, of the work that, you know, my team and all of my colleagues and I have done together with KP Leadership University. Um, and primarily, you know, the reason I'm so kind of proud of this work is that, you know, it wasn't something that was asked of it, us. And I think it's, you know, we came together and really created something that was much bigger and had you know, impacts across regions and boundaries. And so while it started as, you know, looking at you know, leadership development programs in Southern California, it's just continued to kind of grow and grow. So we started looking at, you know, it's not just about managers in Southern California. And, you know, maybe this is about the entire leader experience. And, you know, by the way, we didn't have a truly integrated kind of talent framework. So we need to develop one of those Keep capabilities that'll feed into all aspects of talent management within Kaiser Permanente. And so we need to reach out across performance management teams and play engagement teams and like really develop something bigger, much bigger than us or our roles or our departments um, out in the regions. And so um, I'm just so incredibly proud of the work that my team has done and, and my peers and colleagues and, you know, my, our sponsors around this work have been, you know, truly the best level of sponsorship I've ever seen. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, hashtag KP pride around that. Nice. Love the hashtag KP pride. Okay. Flipping to the other side. What's been your biggest failure or mistake that you've made and what did you learn from it? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of mistakes. You know, I think you can't do really great things unless you're willing to kind of put yourself out there. Um, and you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Um, you know, it, it's funny, you know, I, the word challenge or frustration, I always kind of re-spin that. I, I tend to be kind of the eternal optimist and say, you know, it's opportunity. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if there are, you know, problems or, you know, in that sense, as much as it's opportunities and learnings. So when I think about earlier in my career, I think I you know, felt a lot of pressure of, you know, I've got to do a really great job at something. And I would get, you know, I wouldn't get as much true sponsorship as what's needed to really make things be really owned by our clients and really owned by the business. And so starting out in my career, really thinking, you know, oh, you know, they're, you, they've agreed to be a sponsor. They'll be, they're, they're involved in designing it. You know, they're engaged. Um, but really at more of kind of a surface level without having that skin in the game. And so, you know, one of the things I really tried to learn and focus on is like, Finding those champions, those sponsors, those people 
who really care uh, deep in their hearts about the work that you're doing and aren't just going to you know, show up to a meeting and kick it off, but they are going to be champions and advocates of that work in every aspect of their lives. And I think about you know, um, our regional president in Southern California, Julie Miller Phipps, and she's just a woman that I absolutely admire you know, from the ground up. She's been in this organization since she was a candy striper 40 years ago and, and worked her way up, not as a physician or nurse by background, which in healthcare is you know, a major feat. And, you know, she is an absolute firecracker. She's one of those people that is so nice, so people oriented, but she holds people accountable and she drives for results and having her level of sponsorship and engagement with this work um, across the entire enterprise um, has truly taught me what great sponsorship is. That's cool. And I love the perspective, uh, you know, growth mindset. Uh, we, we tackle and go after hard things and uh, everything is an opportunity to learn. If things don't work out the way we planned, then that's data that shows us that, hey, we, we need to shift directions and maybe pivot and try something else. But it doesn't mean that uh, it necessarily was a failure. Uh, the only failure is really in not trying. So I like that. Um, Laura, are there any uh, trends that you're following that you see are really changing the way people are going to work in the future or changing talent development? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that really interest me. Um, when we think about kind of this war for talent, um, and I think, you know, technology, technology organizations have felt this before healthcare, um, but now we're really feeling this in healthcare. One of the things that's really interesting me is kind of how talent pipelines are starting to go significantly deeper. And so whereas we used to really kind of trust and rely on academia to give us the nurses that we needed, or, you know, technology companies or used to really rely on, you know, academic institutions to give them data scientists. Um, in today's day and age, you know, you see companies like Microsoft on the technology side where they've got a chief learning officer who's starting at, you know, way down in high school and early career to start to build these kind of depth of talent pipelines, really in partnership with, um, academia and you're seeing the same thing in healthcare. There's, you know, with the aging baby boomer population, there's such a shortage of healthcare workers across the board. And so really starting to dive deeper into those talent pipelines um, to help with STEM programs at really early ages um, so that we can really impact talent pipelines. So that's one. Um, I think the other one that's really exciting for me is really around kind of the virtual reality um, within the learning field. So when you look at you know, high stress occupations, whether it's you know being a police officer, being military combat, or being a surgeon in the ER, they've been using virtual reality for so long. Because they know you have to actually be able to simulate these experiences. If you're gonna go and disarm a bomb, you know, you don't just learn about it in the classroom and then go do that um, and think you're gonna be successful. And how do you really hardwire your brain? Um, with behaviors. And so I think about kind of the need for resilience and ability and for people to really develop these skills. Um, I think about a lot of research that's happening with um, stress inoculation training and virtual reality. So if you look at what high performance athletes are starting to do, um, or you know what we're doing with military folks before you know they're going off to high combat zones, we're now able with virtual reality to put them in environments where you, they can feel the levels of stress. We can have haptics um, to ensure that we're measuring things like cortisol levels and really start to prepare people from a resilience perspective so that, you know, in the military, they're not coming back with PTSD. Or if you're in, you know, a highly complex, you know, uh, leadership position, how will we eventually be able to build resilience of folks without actually putting them into these situations? And so, you know, I love that the NFL now is partnered doing all this, this VR learning so instead of running, you know, 50 different tackles, they've realized, wow, we can program the same behavior change through virtual reality that simulates almost, you know, real life. And so I think where this is just starting on kind of the most high impact uses right now, it really excites me. And I don't think we're there yet in learning, um, but I'm really hoping that soon we get to a place where we can really start to look at VR in a learning capacity to build things like resilience and agility. Definitely. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if we're there yet, but I didn't know that about the NFL. And I think I can definitely see how healthcare could be a place where VR becomes really popular and really useful uh, earlier than maybe in other industries because you have such expensive, risky, important procedures that if you can practice in a VR environment before going in and actually doing it uh, in real life, uh, and then you can do that 
you can start to expand that to other parts of talent development. Um, Laura, is there a book that has made a big impact on you or that you often recommend? Yeah, um, I'll give you a couple. Um, the first one is The Art of Possibility. This is one of my all-time favorite books. Um, and it's really around kind of personal, professional mindset. Um, it's the story of really the conductor of, you know, the, the Boston Philharmonic Symphony. And it's completely reframing kind of how we see the world and how we see things. And so, you know, coming back to our challenge and frustration versus opportunity. And when you make a mistake on something, interesting. What have you learned and kind of resetting the way that our brains work so that, you know, we're not judging and measuring up against what we think is right, because what we're really doing is just kind of limiting our possibilities. So phenomenal book. Um, also, I'm a big music lover, so absolutely love the stories that they tell in that one. Um, and then um, there's two others I'd mention. Um, one is kind of oldie but goodie is the four disciplines of execution and this one basically is just like the basics of stop focusing on so many things and focus on doing one to two things really, really well and, and really being disciplined with your time. Um, and then the one I'm reading right now, actually, it's called, uh, I'll give you a little sneak peek. It's called New to Big. Um, and it's really fascinating, uh, written by David Kidder and Christina Wallace. Um, it just came out and it's talking about essentially how do kind of big, large organizations instill kind of a growth operating system, if you will. Um, and so it's, you know, from some serial entrepreneurs that, you know, ha have several different entrepreneurial experiences and are now kind of applying those to the big organizations to tackle this kind of challenge that they're facing around kind of outdated bureaucracy and organizational effectiveness kind of at war with growth. And kind of how do you integrate these things? So those are kind of the books on my mind at the moment. Nice. Uh, I love books. I love reading. Uh, so you mentioned The Art of Possibility, The Four Disciplines of Execution, and New to Big, which I hadn't heard of. And uh, because I love books so much, especially the covers, I'm always looking to see what people are reading. And I saw that book on your table, and I've been wondering for the last <laughs> 30 minutes what that book is. So I'm glad you picked it up and, and you told me. Um, and uh, that's really fascinating. So, okay. Last question for you, Laura, for anybody listening uh, who is working in talent development, looking for ways to accelerate their careers, wanting to get to the next level, what's one more piece of advice you would give? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think the, the last piece of advice I'd give is just um, get to know and understand your business. Understand what you're supporting, the, the kind of the core of the mission and purpose of the business. Um, I think, you know, that's the first one. And the second one is get to know your own purpose because if you don't understand your own purpose, um, it doesn't matter how great you want to work for an organization, um, you won't understand kind of how you align to that. So um, it all comes back to purpose at the end of the day, Andy. Oh, I love that. Uh, going back to a little Simon Sinek, get to know your purpose, <laughs> start with why. Do you know your own purpose, Laura? Put you on the spot. I do. Um, I think my, my purpose is really to kind of repair the world and be a light in the world. And so mm. wanting to make an impact and improve the lives of others is really at, at the heart kind of what drove me back to healthcare and, and to a lot of the kind of philanthropy work I've done. I love it. Mine is, is similar. Um, I have a couple different personal and, and business purposes that kind of merge together. But uh, for me, it's all about loving and supporting my family, continuing to grow and improve, modeling a healthy and intentional lifestyle and helping others and adding value to the world. And I hope that I'm doing that with this podcast. I know that we've done that with this interview because you shared a lot of great advice and experience and information. Um, Laura, for anybody listening that may want to connect or get in touch with you, what's the best way, uh, way for them to do that? Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. Uh, the best way is probably on LinkedIn. You can look for me, Laura Danels on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect and love to um, talk with others who share similar passions. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And, and thank you so much, Andy, for having me today. It's been a, it's just an absolute pleasure talking to you. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure as well. I think we connected on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all day, every day. So if you're not connected with me, make sure you connect with both of us on LinkedIn. And Laura, thank you again. And I uh, wish you the best of luck. Take care. Thanks so much, Andy. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. 